Hello and welcome back to Book and Page. It is the last video on Charles Williams' The Place of the Lion, making it the second last video for season two of Book and Page. How far we have come. But before we talk about that, we should finish up this book. So as always, one last time, we will do a brief summary of what happened in this chapter and then talk about things in a little more detail. Chapter 16 is called The Naming of the Beasts, so you can guess what's going to happen in it. We start, though, with Anthony returning to the town, and at the train station, rather than head right for Damaris' place, he decides to call by his hotel to see if anyone's left any messages for him. Smart thing, too, because Richardson is actually there waiting, and would like to meet up with him quickly to pass on Mr. Berenger's book. They agree to meet along the road, and Anthony actually takes his time to allow Richardson to meet him. As he passes on the book, they have a conversation about images and their power, and Richardson admits that he is off to the burning house to complete his way of negation. Anthony, for a moment, hesitates and then commends him to God, and they part ways one final time. Anthony then continues on to Damaris's place, where she has brought in Dr. Rockbotham to take a look at Quentin. While we don't get any further interactions with Quentin, we do get a last one with Dr. Rockbotham, who has seemingly taken on the proper countenance of the serpent. He is looking much more like the god of medicine from the Greeks, whose symbol was the two twined snake staff that you see even today and Anthony and Damaris recognize him as having achieved something since they last saw him. Once he finishes up and they recognize Quentin is resting, the two of them head out to the final showdown. They joke quite a bit along the way, having a conversation about whether or not Damaris was right in her study of Abelard and whether she should continue. Ultimately, though, she is left behind when they reach the field where she and Quentin met with the lamb. Only Anthony can go beyond this point. Damaris actually struggles with one last moment of doubt and overcomes it in order to watch Anthony, who has perhaps become Adam, enter the Garden of Eden with the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, and name the beasts before sending them away. The lion is the last to go, seeming to hesitate, and Anthony finally sends it off. We get a brief note that the house fire finally goes out, and Anthony and Damaris meet up once more to start home, having overcome all of this for the better. This is sort of an interesting chapter. It does wrap up a lot of things, and while there are some continued philosophical conversations, for the most part we are seeing the ends of these lines of conversation as they come to fruition here. There's a couple characters we definitely want to address at least quickly, and one of them is going to be the elephant in the room, if I'm allowed to use an animal metaphor considering the book we're reading, which would be Richardson and his way of negation. Now, when we first talked about Richardson and Via Negativa, I did mention that there are very extreme versions of this that do ultimately lead to death that certain religious peoples and groups consider appropriate. And this seems to be the outcome that Richardson himself has finally reached. He sort of realized that he never played fully into one or the other, which is very interesting. Because when he saw the unicorn, he sort of realized that he had never been in service to other people. He had never shown proper kindness. You'd think this would be a turn then from the way of negation to the way of confirmation via uh, Firmativa. But instead, we actually have Richardson complete his journey in a very interesting way. The assumption is, of course, that he steps into the fire of the house and is burned up. We are told that no one ever saw him again, and the only two people that were really concerned or upset about it were his landlady and the boss at the bookstore, who ultimately quickly filled his place and moved on. Anthony, though, was aware of what had happened to him. And that's because Richardson and Anthony talk about it directly. 
Now, like I said before, this is a common way for the end of the way of negation. That ultimately, even necessary aspects for human life are far too human and too material to ever successfully spiritually help those people. So there has to be an ultimate rejection of those things and moving on from this plane to the next. Now you also have to be careful about this because there are definitely sects of the Christian religion who would consider this abhorrent. There are definitely groups of Christianity that find suicide of any type and they would definitely find Richardson stepping into the burning house to be a suicide to be incorrect. And this does include Dante. Dante's Divine Comedy includes a section of hell that is called the Forest of Suicides. People wanting to become so unhuman that they ultimately destroy themselves and become trees that still feel pain and bleed. The sides of humanity that they wanted to get rid of become the only ones that they really have. I am not going to say anything one way or the other. Suicide is a very complicated issue and is connected to a lot more issues than just suicide. Depression is horrible to deal with, as is a lot of other things, just PTSD and bullying that ultimately lead to this decision. We are trying to focus, of course, on the via negativa, the removal of the human world in order to achieve the spiritual world, which some groups will tell you is different, others not so much. So ultimately, do we have a noble act here or a not so noble act? Well, Anthony himself isn't even sure. Their conversation about images, again being this material world that you're seeing, is interesting because Anthony has definitely bought into via affirmativa, affirming spirituality and the divine through the things around you. He even finds the form sort of speak to this directly by the fact that they have then subsumed all of the versions of themselves speaking to the fact that all those versions have a spark of the divine in them. For Anthony, these images are really important. They lead to something and you can be improved by acknowledging and embracing them. He's seen that working with Damaris and he can believe that it's worked with Quentin as well, considering that Quentin has survived up to this point. But he won't say no to Richardson. In fact, ultimately, he doesn't say anything. He simply commands Richardson to God. So there are some possibilities here. Ultimately, Richardson is in the wrong and Anthony simply chooses not to say anything. You've noticed this a couple of times that people have been commended to God and it's usually when they don't have any control after that point and the person can't be changed back. Richardson commends Mr. Foster to God simply because the man's too far gone to do anything. We can recognize that with Richardson himself. He has seen his via negativa to the point where there is only one way that he can go. Now maybe he certainly improved that by seeing the unicorn. We've been told several times throughout this text that the unicorn is one of the positive animals to see and that people who have seen it go out without fear of the other forms. But he still aims to complete his way of negation. It could be that both ways are in fact applicable and it simply takes very specific types of people that the way of negation is going to work for them. Most people, the way of, the way of negation isn't going to work simply because we are in fact too human. We view too much of the material world as being our world, that we don't see it necessarily as images. Truth be told, Richardson is very much in the cave here. He's recognized that the images by the fire are precisely images, but even upon getting out of Plato's cave, he still sees the world around him, including the sun, as images. Now the sun perhaps is the one that is not as much an image because he believes the fire is the way to complete his way of negation. 
that it will be able to complete everything, despite the fact that the world is a lot more complicated than he originally perceived it to be. The burning house is the way through. Now this does buy into the idea that we talked about earlier, with the fire being a communication symbol to all the players of the game, including the beasts themselves, but also perhaps to Richardson and how all of this is going to end. The other important person that went up with that flame was Mr. Berenger, who seems to have started all of this at some point. I'm not going to say one way or the other. A lot of people who are very religious are either going to really like this moment or really hate it depending on their own beliefs. And Richardson here has his own belief. Anthony recognizes there's nothing he can do to change that, so he simply again commands the man to God and they separate ways. Richardson passing on the book though says something about that fact. While Richard himself doesn't believe that the images are helpful to him, he seems to recognize that they are going to be helpful to most other people. So Richardson at least is allowing for the fact that the way of negation is not for everybody. He's not willing to destroy the knowledge that is going to help other people achieve the ends that Anthony is in the process of doing. So Richardson at least seems to believe that both via affirmativa and via negativa are viable options. Anthony himself hesitates but allows Richardson to make that choice. It's sort of an interesting end, especially since again that we then get the very human end of him essentially being forgotten by really tentative friendships. Prior to this point, we were just told how important friendships are and that the place of the lion is strength in friendships. So Richardson's via negativa makes a lot of sense partially because he didn't have those strong friendships. His idea of the way of negation is perhaps the only way he has to go because he's already been on that path. For Anthony, Quentin, and Damaris, who thrive on relationships, even if they haven't been very positive ones up to this point, that is all that they can really achieve either. You have to pick the appropriate path for yourself. Next up, we definitely have to address two people, and that would be Quentin and Dr. Berenger. Quentin doesn't really get an end to his story outside of the fact that he did ultimately come around and walk with Damaris. So we are given the sense that he is going to come out of this all right, just not as a major player of any of this. This is sort of contrasted with Dr. Berenger, who we thought wasn't going to be a major player, but undergoes an interesting transformation in this very last chapter. I'm going to go ahead and read that, uh, because both Anthony and Damaris sees this. In fact, Damaris admits that she used to think him a little fool. Now, this could have been a change from Damaris's perspective, but the fact that Anthony agrees with her says that uh, both of them sort of fell into this little trap. Uh, he had never been a particularly notable figure, this being Dr. Rockbotham, until now. But now, indeed, in the hackneyed but convincing fa phrase, Anthony saw him for the first time. The lines of his face were unaltered, but it was molded in a great strength and confidence. The eyes were deep and wise, the mouth closed firmly, as if the oath of Hippocrates, the seal of silence and knowledge of discretion. It's the Greek name for the god of medicine. I'm not going to try and say it. Anthony had thought to himself and remembered the snake, which was the symbol of the man. We sneer at medicine, he thought, but after all, we do know more. Not much, but a little. We sneer at progress, but we do, in a way, progress. The gods have an abandoned man. For a moment, he dreamed of a white-robed, bearded figure with a great serpent coiled by him, where in some remote temple of Epirotus or Paragonus, the child of Phoebus Apollo labored to heal men by the art that he had learned from the tawny-formed Chiron, the master of herbs. Zeus had destroyed him by lightning, at last, by lightning at last, since by his wisdom the dead were recalled to life. In the sacred order, the world was in danger of being broken. But the serpent wreathed rod was still outstretched, and still the servants of the art were sent out by their father on missions of health. 
So we do have this moment where the snake is finally positively associated with something, which is the subtlety of medicine. It's the subtle balance between life and death. And this is very interesting because the story accounted here is basically true. So this uh, son of Apollo basically learned so much about the art of healing and medicine that he's bringing the dead back to life and offsetting the balance of everything. Hades finally goes to Zeus and says, fix it. And Zeus kills, <laughs> kills the poor guy to prevent this from happening, thus restoring the order of the world. But of course we are still progressing, medicine is still improving, and so we constantly have this balance, this subtle balance between life and death with the help of medicine. So suddenly the snake isn't necessarily just bad. Up to this point in time, it has been the animal that has always had a negative association. Partially through, again, the biblical image of Satan taking the form of the snake to convince Eve and Adam ultimately to eat the forbidden fruit, but also through people like Miss Wilmot, who's been really the only person associated with the serpent up to this point. Suddenly we have a much more positive one, and again, association that can become biblical. Death to a person as a sacrifice to restore balance to the world, especially having that person bring the dead back to life, sounds a lot like Christ, doesn't it? It's a very similar image. Now, the association to the serpent here is going to the Greek one rather than to the biblical, but that's to show again how close this conversation has wrapped the two. The Greek and the Christian are not that far off from each other if you're willing to step back and not get overly angry about these different associations. So Dr. Berenger has had this moment of triumph in becoming the proper version of the subtlety of the snake. That's what we've been told the snake is. Subtlety, subtle knowledge, subtle use of it, and subtle shutting up when you need to. This change has happened between the last time that both Damaris and Anthony saw Dr. Berenger, but it also likely happened between the last time we as the readers have seen him, which was during the burning house chapter when he unjustly said that the nurse should have been in the house with the two people when it went up in flames. He has learned something from there. He saw how aggressive everyone can become and likely learned a lesson about watching his own tongue and choosing when to say something, even when he thinks it and choosing when not to. That's another subtlety that becomes really important. It's the three sieves of Socrates again. Is it true, good and necessary? If not, shut up, you're going to make it worse. Dr. Berenger seems to have learned that, and he comes through looking the better for it. Hopefully, again, we can all keep these lessons after the animals are sent away. So, Quentin is probably going to be looking better for the fact that he ended up bowing to the lamb and surviving the lion, and Dr. Berenger, why do I keep calling him Dr. Berenger? It's Dr. Rock Botham. For some reason, I continually get these two mixed up through the entire video series. But Dr. Rockbotham also looking better for it, having survived the lions that were brought to the fire and coming to embody the positivity of the serpent. So we have now handled Richardson. Quentin is resting, but he's likely the better for it, for meeting with the lamb. Dr. Rockbotham with the serpent. And now we have Damaris and Anthony. As they head off, there is, of course, a divide that forms, and this is another gendered divide. Adam goes forth to name the beasts because Eve cannot. While we are told in the last chapter that the voice of humanity calling to humanity must be of two voices, Adam and Eve, Adam himself, in this account at least, was the one to name the beasts. This goes back to very early in this video series where we talked about the differences between the two verses, verses in Genesis. How originally we get a very short account, which has the creation of humanity being the dual humanity, and then the naming of the beasts, and then sort of stepping back and having Adam alone and the creation of Eve. 
Some people have used these different accounts to have a first woman also made of dust like Adam, that would be Lilith, who then rebelled against stewardship under Adam and was rejected so that Eve could come in. But here, there is not another woman at all during the naming of the animals. It is purely Adam who does so. So our Eve representative in Damaris is left behind. But interestingly, we do have some moments with her. The entire naming of the animal scene is seen from Damaris's point of view. And this is sort of really interesting because we're told Damaris watched Anthony as Eve might have watched Adam, but we've already been told that, that by this account, Eve wasn't there. Beside that point, I find it really interesting in a lot of ways, Damaris's account here. First and foremost, of course, we have the temptation of Damaris. Let's pull that up. We have moments where she starts backsliding into previous thoughts that she had had. Uh, either this was a horrid dream or else Anthony had lured her into some insane midnight expedition. It was always the same. No one ever considered her. No one thought about her. Her father had died in a most inconvenient moment. There would be all the business of what small capital he had. No one, no one ever considered her and the work she was trying unselfishly to do uh, as a con contribution to the history of philosophical thought. We're seeing that backsliding. This is the temptation of Eve redone, which is to say that the snake goes to Eve, well, Satan in the guise of the snake, goes to Eve and says that she would be a boon to humanity and to Adam if she had the knowledge that was forbidden by the tree. She could even become closer to God that way. This is seemingly what Damaris at least is thinking to herself, the contribution to the history of philosophical thought that she's trying to do unselfishly. This is the temptation reoccurring here and a very deep one for all of humanity. Most of us are going to fully admit that we never want to be forgotten. We want to make the world remember us, or at least certain people important to us remember us. And this can prompt us to make some choices that maybe aren't the best. Thankfully though, unlike Eve, who ultimately does give in to this temptation, that's where original sin comes from, that's why a lot of people hate on women, no worries, Eve. I still like you. Damaris overcomes this, but overcomes this again, interestingly, I find in the vein of Eve. Uh, she ends up moving to rise, uh, and she realizes, of course, that uh, even in a nightmare, even in a nightmare, she needn't crouch. She can stand full. Um, Something for one second held her down. It held her that slender literature of unrealized devotion for the second that the old hateful things took to flood her and a little to recede. So something is, uh, is holding her down as the flood hits her and she comes out the other side. The years of selfish toil had at any rate this good. They had been years of toil. She had not easily abandoned any search because of difficulty. And that habit of intention by its own power of good offered her salvation then. And that word here, toil, is very interesting because ultimately when Adam and Eve are sent out of the Garden of Eden, it's into a life of toil. Rather than always being given what they need to survive from the fruit of the tree, they will now have to toil in order to survive. They have to till the soil, they have to plant, and they have to harvest in and of themselves. There is some belief here as well that humanity was originally meant to be vegetarian, but upon getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden, animals became another option to eat. I'm not going to get into that argument, but it's the idea of toil. Humanity is here precisely to work in service to ourselves, to each other, and to God. So suddenly this word toil connects with the very positive term of service. It was toil, and she's learned to overcome difficulty difficult things, which is good in and of itself. 
She might not have been aimed at the correct things at the time, but she's learned how to work towards these things. And she can now reorient herself and work towards positive outcomes. Toil is important. And toil is what eventually actually saved Adam and Eve. Toiling in the world is both the punishment, but as we talked about with Damaris, it is sort of, well, it's the punishment they have to go through to show they're really sorry for what they did, the mistakes they made. They have confession, where eventually they go before God and admit what they did, and then they have penance. The toil is their penance. So Damaris learning to toil for positive things, having toiled often for negative things, she has overcome her selfishness in this moment and can now toil the proper way. It's a fascinating one that's just come in the use of one word twice. Ultimately, though, of course, the focus for the chapter, well, from Damaris's point of view, is on Anthony slash Adam. It is a question of whether or not um, he becomes Adam in this moment, he is just Anthony in this moment, if he is a combination of both. The combination of both is in all likelihood, because we've had, again, the images subsuming the regular things, right? So the lion shows up having subsumed the lioness into it. What I like about humanity is we've already been told that it's the two voices of humanity, originally Adam and Eve. But suddenly going forward in the naming of the animals, it is still two voices. It's Adam and Anthony. And there's just some things in this moment of the naming of the beasts that I find really interesting. For example, the intermingling of the trees of knowledge and of life, if indeed they were separate. So again, that highlight that knowledge and life go together. Damaris was not wrong to pursue intellectual pastimes, she was wrong to do it selfishly. I'm almost here, let's, let's find it. Um, it's, it's in this image of the beast coming to Adam uh, and as he's naming them, how for a moment he stands in between the lion and the lamb. Wish I had highlighted it. Um, what I really like about this image, I would love to be able to find it and read it, is it's just a, a really quick moment where he has his hand, ah, there it is, but far below the human figure stood and on either side of it were the shapes of the lion and the lamb. His hand rested on the head of the one the other paused by him. And again, this is really subtle, but he is physically touching one and not the other. And by the being told the shapes of the lion and the lamb, and then the one and the other, tells us that Anthony is physically touching the lion, but not the lamb. This is really cool because we've already been told that the place of the lion is the place of friendship. The strength is in community. So Anthony physically touching the lion makes sense. The lion is most definitely a human trait. But the lamb, we've already discussed, is a divine symbol. It is the symbol of Christ, the lamb of God. Mercy, sacrifice, and innocence all wrapped into one. Things that humans can not perfect and have to bow to the divine to receive in their most perfect forms. So the fact is, Anthony cannot physically touch the lamb because that is a divine aspect that even him, as representing Adam, cannot achieve. The divine lamb is purely divine, while the other animals can interact and perhaps even in the rarest of moments be perfected in humanity. The lamb is that connection with the divine, divine mercy, sacrifice, and innocence that we receive. So I find it really interesting, especially then how the lion tends to linger. The lion is most definitely the big human trait that can get corrupted and go nuts. 
So the fact that the lion was the first to arrive makes a lot of sense, and the last to leave, additionally, where Adam has to plant himself and rain down the power that he feels in this moment to order the lion to leave. This is important because, again, humanity, while ha having their strength in community, can go a little nuts, and the next thing you know, you're a tyrant of your relationships, your friendships, or an entire city-state. You have to be very careful when it comes to the lion and only accept it as part of all of these other forms, not in and of itself, or you will be Mr. Foster. So Anthony turning around and sending the lion forth makes a lot of sense. Ultimately, we end up getting this flashback to the common folks, one of the firemen who doesn't quite understand what's happening, but does have these moments, tells us that even we as little understanding as we may be, can have these moments of seeing, and if you think about it really hard, you can ultimately understand it as well. We finish, of course, with the short conversation. In a minute, he looked at her. I say, you're not cold, are you? He asked. I wish you'd got a coat or something. It's not very she far, she answered. No, I'm not cold. So we come back to the very human world again, where we're Dante. We've hit the end of this journey, but from the very beginning, we were told this happened in the middle of his life. He still has to go back to the human world, and he can backpedal from here. Adam and Eve have disappeared, and this is purely Anthony and Damaris in a cold world that is going to challenge them constantly, in which they must toil. So we are the children of Adam and Eve in the end, but not the divine aspects of them. Ultimately, though, we still have that community aspect. Anthony and Damaris, we're told by Charles Williams, are more likely to be okay because they have each other to help correct and continue on. A very human moment at the end that shows the divine aspects of human relationships, community, and friendship to the bitter end. But it's okay because it's not that cold. Wow, that was a wild ride. There are definitely some aspects of this text I'm still not comfortable with, but there's definitely some philosophies I find fascinating if we're allowed to apply them to any and all genders. Oh, thank you for that. And season two is almost at an end. We've just finished up our last text for the season, but we will have one more video where we wrap up the entire season hopefully rather briefly. I don't think <laughs> you've struggled through all of this to hear me continue blabbing on, but as always, I hope you keep reading, whether it's this text, any of the texts we've talked about this season, or any of the myriad of others. Keep reading, keep learning, keep having conversations, and forming friendships. I'm gonna keep reading too, so I'll see you next time to wrap things up for Book and Page Season 2.